join me in the call to worship found in your bulletin. May our worship be centered. May the words of our mouths be acceptable to the Lord. You may be seated. Good morning and welcome to River Road Church on this Sunday morning. Whether you're here in the sanctuary or joining via the live stream, we are so glad to have you join us. At this time, I would ask that you please pass the maroon binder down the aisle, making note of your presence here with us today. If you are visiting, this allows our, us the opportunity to reach out to you later in the week. If you came to worship today wanting to join our church as we seek to be a faithful disciples of Jesus, your opportunity to do so will be directly after the sermon during the time of reflection and response. You may come forward to these steps and our pastor will meet you there. Also, we know that many of you give online to support the ministries of this church and we thank you. You'll find in your pew rack a card that says, I give online. If you're one of the many of us that give online, feel free to place this card in the offering plate at that time. Today, there will be a brief business meeting following worship here in the sanctuary. If you are visiting, you're welcome to stay, but know it's all right if you leave. Members, we hope that you will stay as this will be a brief meeting and we need a quorum to proceed. Because there is a business meeting today, there will not be a reception. Tonight, please make plans to join us for our Sunday evening thoughtful faith activities. Matt Rooney and Emma Phelps will lead youth and adults in a conversation and activities about what Taylor Swift can teach us about community. As a fellow Swifty, I can tell you I'm looking forward to this. It should be a lively time full of fun and activities. If you did not sign up for dinner, you can bring your own or join us at 6 p.m. in the fellowship hall. There will be activities for all ages. And please make plans to join us next week as we will have a community mission project of writing letters to our homebound members and packing care packages for our college students. These are tangible ways we can support all ages of our congregation. Christian sympathy is extended to William and Eleanor Nerney on the death of his father, Jack W. Nerney, and to Jordan and Jake on the death of their grandfather on September 29th, 2003. The memorial service for Joyce Parker will be in the chapel this Thursday at 2 p.m. There will be a reception following in the fellowship hall. As you can see, there are many things happening within the life of our church. Trunk or Treak is coming, coming, a Vox Humana concert, and many more. Please pay attention to our social media, church website, or the weekly e-newsletter, the eSpire, that comes out on Tuesdays. You'll find many ways to be involved and in how you can sign up. Now let us settle our hearts and minds and join me together in prayer. Creator God, from the mountaintop in ancient Israel, you gave your people ways in which to live in harmony with all creation. As time has progressed, the power of these words seem to have faded in our lives as we give into the many things that pull at our lives daily. God, remind us of your words of compassion and hope that are offered to all of us. This hour, open our hearts so that, we may, so that we may hear and receive your love and direction in our lives. It is in the name of your Son who taught us to pray that we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Good morning. My name is Mike Klingenpeel. And my name is Hatcher. Hatcher is my oldest grandson. Hatcher, how many, uh, do, you, do you have brothers and sisters? Yes, I do. Be a little more specific. Uh, tell, me, uh, tell me about your brothers. I have two younger brothers. Okay, two younger brothers. How old are you? Seven. And what grade are you in, in school? Second grade. What do you want to be when you grow up? A pastor or a scientist. A pastor or a scientist. Those two have a, a lot in common. What do you like best about coming to church? Um, I like to sing and read the Bible. Do you have a favorite Bible story? Moses and the Red Sea. Moses and the Red Sea. That's an important one. I noticed, Hatcher, when I sit next to you in worship that you put uh, some money in the offering plate when the offering plate is passed. Why do you do that? Because I know it supports our church. It supports our church. That is wonderful. Tell me what you're thankful for. I'm thankful for family, friends, and church. Hatcher, um, I suspect you have some questions for me. Yes, I do. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, then why don't you ask me the questions you have for me? When did you start coming to River Road Church? The first time I came to River Road Church was, I counted them up, 55 years ago. I was a student at the University of Richmond, and in those days, University of Richmond brought, uh, sent a bus to campus, and I would catch the bus and come over here to go to church. What is your favorite Bible verse? I've always loved Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not unto your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will direct your paths. Why do you and Nana give money to the church? I think Nana and I give money to the church, Hatcher, for two reasons. One is because the church needs uh, our gifts to help support the wonderful ministries of the church. This beautiful building, uh, the staff that serves uh, our community, uh, so many of the wonderful ministries that are conducted here in church. So I, we give in part because the church needs our contributions. But maybe more importantly, we give because it's important, we, we need to give. We need to give because giving is an expression of our love for God, and it's an expression of how we've already been blessed by God. So I think we give because the church needs it, but more importantly, we give because as followers of Jesus, we need to give. What are you thankful for? I'm thankful for a lot of things, Hatcher. I'm thankful for this wonderful church I'm thankful for the freedom that we have to come to worship uh, uncoerced. We have a choice whether we love God or not love God, and that's a wonderful freedom that uh, is, is ours in this good land of ours. So I'm grateful for that freedom. And I guess uh, particularly I'm grateful for this, this Christian community that we're a part of at River Road Church. I know that these people support us and love us, and if we have needs, will help us. And, you know, our lives are immeasurably rich, uh, enriched because we are a part of this community. What is your favorite hymn? My favorite hymn is one that actually is not really known by, well by a lot of people. It's entitled, O oh Master, Let Me Walk With Thee. It was written a long time ago by, uh, the words were written by a man named Washington Gladden, who was a pastor in Columbus, Ohio. And I've always thought that that was a very special hymn for my life. And I guess the other thing I'm thankful for, Hatcher, 
is you and to be able to watch you grow up uh, in school and in your family and especially in your love for God right here at River Road Church. So God bless you, Hatcher, and thank you for having this conversation with me. You're welcome. That man looks very familiar. <laughs> As we read our scriptures this morning, the first one comes from the Hebrew Bible, which we know as our Old Testament. The book is Exodus. It's one of the two particular passages that focus on the Ten Commandments. Hear ye then the word. Then God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the hand of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in the heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord God will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. Honor your father and your mother so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house you shall not covet your neighbor's wife or male or female slave or ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. When all the people witnessed the thunder and the lightning, the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, they were afraid and trembled and stood at a distance and said to Moses, you speak to us and we will listen but do not let God speak to us or we will die. Moses said to the people, do not be afraid for God has come only to test you and to put the fear of him upon you so that you do not sin. The word of the Lord. And from the New Testament, Paul writes different letters, and this one comes from Philippians, the third chapter, as he speaks. If anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Yet, 
Whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For His sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God based on faith. I want to know Christ and the power of His resurrection and the sharing of His sufferings and by becoming like Him in His death if somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this. But I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it on my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal of the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. The word of the Lord. The hymn writer Shirley Elena Murray offered these words. 
silences a friend who claims us, cools the heat and slows the pace. God it is who speaks and names us, knows our being, touches base, making space within our thinking, lifting shades to show the sun, raising courage when we're shrinking, find scope for faith begun. Holy God, we are afraid of silence. So much of our world is claimed by noise and clamor. But here in this place, we are called to let go, to let go of the noise, to let go of the anxiety and worry, to let go of our fears. And this hour, we offer prayers for the hurting and lost, for those suddenly plagued by war and tragedy. The events of the weekend overseas are alarming. We come with concerns for, our, for family, friends, our communities, and the world. And this hour, calm our hearts. Silence is truly a friend who claims us. Now, for just a moment, be in silence. Let the beating of your heart and the rhythm of your breathing be your focus for just a moment. Put aside your worries. Focus on God. God of our lives, who offers us peace in the silence. A moment, apart, a moment apart from the demands and struggles of life. Relax our spirits today. We have brought to you the names and situations which have claimed our worries and attention. We come seeking healing for those who suffer, comfort for those who mourn, direction for the lost, and peace for all your people. We have brought our joys and celebrations to you, thanking you for the many ways in which you have touched our lives with your love. Give us peace and strength for our service to this world. All of this we ask in your name. Amen.
are invited to share our blessings generously with our church, community, and world. By sharing our gifts freely, God will be honored and glorified in our giving. May we give with joy and thankfulness so that we all may have enough. Amen.
Before I begin, please allow me a point of personal privilege. One of our dear members, Betty Houston, who is probably watching us right now from her apartment at Lakewood, will turn 100 years old next week. And so I'd like to publicly wish her a happy birthday. Betty, your church loves you and we celebrate with you. The Revised Common Lectionary is a three-year system of Bible readings, year A, year B, year C. We're in year A, by the way. The lectionary guides the planning of worship here at River Road Church and at many churches around the world. The lectionary suggests a reading from the Hebrew Bible, also a psalm, a gospel reading, and then an epistle reading for most Sundays. And many churches use this system as it follows the rhythms of the liturgical year and allows us to read much of Scripture in this three-year cycle. Well, the lectionary today suggests a reading from the Hebrew Scriptures from Exodus 20. The passage comprises what we popularly call the Ten Commandments. Now, the Ten Commandments this particular version from Exodus 20 appears twice in the lectionary cycle. Once today, in late Pentecost season of year A, the other time we receive this reading is early in Lent in year B. Be listening for that next spring. There aren't many readings that get repeated in the lectionary cycle. Therefore, there must be something crucial, special, or foundational about the Ten Commandments that we give them more attention than a quick glance or sporadic reading. That said, I must admit, and you already know this, I rarely preach on the Ten Commandments, particularly considering it comes up twice in each three-year cycle. I'm not entirely sure why that is. The other readings for the day are well done. I suppose I choose another one of those, but I I suspect also that we tend to assume that we know these commandments pretty well. What else can I say? In fact, if, if I went around this sanctuary room today asking us to name the commandments, as a group, I think we'd come up with all ten pretty easily. We've heard these over and over again. I am reminded this morning that it's long been a goal of mine to open a Ten Commandment-themed bakery. I would call it the Glaze Do Nots. Now, see, Andrea thought nobody would laugh at that. (laughs) Can't wait to tell her. No, seriously, I suspect when most of us approach the Ten Commandments, most of us think about them as a list of rules, things we ought not do. Sort of like the first day of each class grade, where the teacher puts on the blackboard or on large poster board class rules. But I want us to take a fresh look and perhaps consider that the Ten Commandments are not lists of do's and don'ts, but rather a pathway to freedom a celebration of the life that God has given us. But I'm getting ahead of myself. The first time I ever preached on these Ten Commandments, Ashley was probably three or four years old, and we were living 
in North Carolina at the time. It was early on a Sunday morning, and she arose and found me at the kitchen table with my laptop, reviewing my sermon for worship in a few hours. Ashley climbed into my lap, looked at the computer screen, and said, Papa, what are you preaching on today? Well, sweetheart, I'm preaching on the Ten Commandments. She replied, Ugh, all ten? <laughs> yes, all ten. I'm preaching on all ten again today because they are to be read together, I believe. Taken together, these are less about escaping judgment and more about living gratefully and graciously as God's people. Do you remember Judge Roy Moore? Moore is the former Chief Justice of the Alabama Supreme Court, and he waged a fight to keep a large monument of the Ten Commandments right outside his courtroom chambers. Well, Moore lost that fight, and then because of that, he lost his job. So between jobs and running for the next office, Judge Roy began lugging his Ten Commandments monument all around the country. You may remember seeing this. He lugged this huge monument on the back of a flatbed truck, appearing before churches, civic groups, and the like. And the problem was this monument, you may recall, was massive. Two and a half tons, to be exact, 5,280 pounds. Wherever the monument was to be displayed, they had to call in engineers to calculate whether the floor could actually support it. Not only that, it had to be delivered on a custom-made truck and lifted with a custom-made forklift. My point here is not a political one because... I actually read last week that Moore has run for office as both a Democrat and a Republican, interestingly enough. My point is that we make a grave mistake, I believe, when we view the Ten Commandments as some monolithic monument, some great weight or massive burden that has to be shown to people, rather than a set of scriptures that we hide within our hearts that provide for us freedom and affirmation of life given to us by God. I love what Tom Long says. He says the Ten Commandments are not weights, but instead wings that enable our hearts to catch the wind of God's spirit and soar. Indeed, the Ten Commandments are all about relationship and freedom. Here's what I mean. Right off the bat, we get an idea as to the context for the Ten Commandments. Notice that God does not begin with, listen up everyone, these are the rules I expect you to follow. No, that's not the way it begins. God begins with a reminder of the close and particular relationship that God has with the Hebrew people. It begins with, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. I believe with that opening line, the scene is then set. When the Israelites heard that, They knew that what was to follow was born not out of a desire to oppress, but liberate. You remember the story, don't you? For 400 years, the children of Israel had labored as slaves in Egypt. 400 years. Church, that means that grandparents, great-grandparents, great-great-grandparents were born, lived, and died, not ever 
knowing freedom. But God had not forgotten them. God hears their cries and says to Moses, Moses, tell Pharaoh to let my people go. And after ten plagues to convince Pharaoh to relent, he finally does. And so they quickly begin the journey. With no time to lose, the Israelites pack up their belongings and they leave. Pharaoh has a change of heart and sends his army to force the Israelites back into Egypt. Back to slavery, back to bondage. But as they are fleeing... Just a step ahead of the army, the Israelites come upon the banks of the Red Sea. Interestingly enough, I did not know Hatcher was going to tell us that was one of his favorite Bible stories today. It's one of mine too, Hatcher. I love this story because you, you just know the Israelites are standing on the edge of the, great, of, of the banks of the Red Sea saying, great, now what are we supposed to do? You'll remember that God instructs Moses to raise his hand above the sea and the water parts. Miraculously, there's dry land upon which they can walk. And of course, Pharaoh's army follows quickly behind. But once the Israelites are across, the waters come together again, drowning the army. Behind them was Egypt, ahead was wilderness. Behind them was slavery, ahead was freedom. Behind was an awful life, but it was one they knew. Ahead, who knows? Yet they knew they were in this journey together. As they crossed the sea, crossing from fear to faith, This was an experience that I believe changed them somehow. There was no going back, literally or figuratively. The Israelites entered the sea as refugees, but they emerged as God's promised nation. I'm recounting all of this because when the Hebrews hear, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, their story, their story of being led from slavery into freedom, it all comes rushing back. Church, I am suggesting to you this morning that we cannot read the Ten Commandments without this context. The liberation from slavery to freedom must be the lens, I believe, through which we read these commandments. In other words, God is not so much saying, do this, don't do that. Instead, God is saying, I am the Lord your God. You are my beloved children. I love you so much that I want you to live in freedom, not in bondage. Therefore, these commandments, this is who we are. This is how we are going to live. And this is what we are all about. A few years ago, for a podcast that I was recording with some friends, I took the liberty of rewriting the Ten Commandments, so to speak, a sort of new revised Daniel version, which, for me at least, captures the essence of what these commandments are supposed to be, the context in which they are to be understood. So if you'll permit me, I'd like to share them with you. God, you are the one who led us out of slavery. In you, we have freedom. Therefore, we don't need any other God. God, your love lives so deep within our souls. We have no need for idols. God, you have brought us into your holy family. 
so we will always respect your name. You have freed us from the bondage of constant work, so we will rest every now and again, especially on the Sabbath. God, because we are your children, because you are our heavenly parent, we will respect the fathers and the mothers that you have given us here on earth. Because you are a God who has given us life, we will not kill. God, you have always been faithful to us. So we will be faithful in our relationships, especially with our spouses. Lord, you have given us everything. We have no need to steal from others. In you, O oh Lord, we find truth. There is no reason to lie. God, you have poured out such rich blessings upon us. Our hearts have no room for jealousy. Friends, it's not about burdens or limits. It's about joy and freedom and life kind of people that God has called us to be, the kind of people that deep within our hearts we know we want to be. May it be so. Amen.
beloved, may the grace of God dwell in you richly. May the peace of Christ rule in your heart and in your home. And may the hope of the Holy Spirit lead you to serve this world with incredible love.